Welcome to Graveyard Crypto. Today's date is November 19th. Uh, we're going to say talk about Bitcoin and basically to FOMO or not to FOMO. That is the question. So uh, we're going to go to Jeff first and we're going to ask him the question on how he feels on the current situation of Bitcoin where the price is almost at 18000 driving up, driving down, kind of sitting there right now. And, you know, there's a lot of new people getting into the game. A lot of new people want to invest or buy Bitcoin. And it's a very tricky situation right now because it is almost at an all time high. I mean, we could be days away from that. So Jeff, what do you think about that? Are you FOMOing or are you going to sit back and maybe wait? <laughs> I don't really FOMO anymore. 2018 was my FOMO year. <clears throat> but um, interesting, we were chatting as we always do about Bitcoin. And we've all had people reaching out to us again as the number goes up, basically. Um, what's interesting too, we're not at an all-time high price, but we are at an all-time high market cap for Bitcoin. Because since the last all-time high price, more Bitcoin exists, so there's more supply, which makes the price a little lower, but the market cap. So there's more money in the Bitcoin market. Okay. If you look at it that way, and a lot of the other um, metrics you can gauge Bitcoin by are at all time highs too. But at any rate, I pulled a few articles to try to kind of explain to people what's been going on in the background if they're unaware. So I'm going to jump on a screen share here. Now, when you said with uh, Bitcoin's mark capping at an all time high, uh, is that also for the total uh, cryptocurrency market or just Bitcoin itself? Because um, I know. Yeah, Bitcoin definitely is. That's for Bitcoin itself. The all-time high market cap of the entire crypto market was like uh, eight hundred billion, and I know now we're tapping overall five hundred billion or so in the entire market. Right. Um, yeah. I just so the, it's it's the Bitcoin show right now. Everyone's talking about Bitcoin. That's what the focus is, uh, and I'll get into a little of that now as I share a few of these articles and stuff. Just some things I've been uh, focusing on, but just to explain briefly for those who don't know. At the point we're at now, as you can see, 18 and a half million Bitcoin are in existence right now out of the 21 million that will ever be mined. So there is only two and a half left to be created ever. As you can see, 88 plus percent has already been issued. We're only getting 900 a day right now. Um, and in approximately four years, a little less than four years, that 900 is going to get cut in half on a daily basis. That's the four-year cycle. Maybe we'll touch on that in another video. But you can see how the supply drops down and the issuances. These, these areas here are the halvings. And that's right. how the supply goes down. So it kind of explains as Bitcoin is created, less and less is created over time with an ultimate cap of 21 million. Not to mention, and I pulled, this is the most recent one I could find really quickly. This is from 2019, but it says 20% of all Bitcoins already lost from people messing up, moving yeah, it around, losing their seed phrases. Um, <clears throat> so even out of those 18 and a half million that exist, at least 20% of them can never be accessed again. That cuts deeply into that supply that exists right now. Right. And just to, to kind of talk about that too, um, the creator of Bitcoin, Nobody knows who he is, but the you know pseudonym uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. When that person had, or a group of people had started mining Bitcoin, they had uh, was it a million uh, Bitcoins mined? I think it's just and, over a million, one million, yeah. Right. So that's another you know part of that where it's like, wow, one million of that. Who knows? And I don't think that's moved at all or anything like that. I, I don't. I don't think has nobody's touched it say, basically since uh, its inception, right? It's but, only ever just received the block rewards. I think, yeah. Okay, yeah. And going also to what you're saying, there are 900 Bitcoin a day. I just did a quick calculation. That would basically be uh, about 16 million Bitcoin being pro or 16 million dollars USD cash price uh, worth. Per, produced per day which is kind of interesting if you want to look at it in that way yeah you got to make sure there's at least 16 million coming in every day as far as demand is concerned which we all know that's probably more than that yeah we'll get to some of that too yeah but yeah i think um 
that's what some of these institutional bigger name investors are starting to realize. Um, you know, the prices may be higher now than they could have bought in the past. They're starting to realize how little is actually available. Um, and that's why we're getting these big influxes of large sums of money from certain types of investors. Yeah, as you can see here, the supply drought is driving up the price of Bitcoin. This is from today. Wow. Look at this poor guy. He's looking for Bitcoin in the desert. Can't find any. He needs his Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty wild uh, looking at it because we know that um, Grayscale, uh, which uh, if anybody's interested in actually owning Bitcoin without really owning it, um, it's kind of like a Bitcoin ETF. It's a uh, GBTC. If you want to look up the ticker, I'm getting that right over here. Yeah, yeah, that's it's wild. That is a very good point, and I think it's important to touch on um, because, as I just mentioned, like the, the 20% of Bitcoin's been lost, lost. It's on the blockchain, but it's not accessible anymore because people misplaced their passwords or whatever other mistakes they may have made. So, if you feel like that's a barrier to entry from you from a technological standpoint, you can go on to E-Trade, pick your favorite investing software or platform, and you can buy the stock ticker GBTC at a premium. I've actually bought it and sold it before. So I bought it at a premium. It was more expensive than regular Bitcoin, but I also sold it at that premium. Right. So I, I didn't really ever have to absorb that, that premium price, so to speak. I just kind of, you know, I wrote it up for a while, then I sold it and took a profit at a point. Um, yeah, Grayscale, I believe, too, there's an advantage. I read, do your own research, of course. Um, if you invest in Bitcoin on Robinhood, you can't ever withdraw the Bitcoin and take control of it, which may become something you really want to do in the future, just because of the rarity of this thing. Um, but Grayscale, I believe, you can actually redeem your GBTC stocks, shares, or actual Bitcoin. I've read that yeah. that's the case. And as you, you know, we, we get... The three of us, obviously, we see these reports all the time of how much money they're, they're buying up more Bitcoin that's created on a daily basis right now. Yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's pretty amazing um, how basically Grayscale is buying more Bitcoin than is being mined. So at some point, you know, that's going to all run out. And that's not even including who knows who else is buying this stuff up. That's just one entity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You could also buy shares of MicroStrategy, which is probably underpriced mm -hmm. comparative to the GPT, GBTC. Just another That's way. That's a good point, too. They would call that uh, indirect exposure, I think. Um, I didn't pull up a MicroStrategy article, but that's a company. They took their entire treasury, I think it was just shy of $500 million in cash they had, and they put it all into Bitcoin. So that could be an million. indirect way to in, you know, get exposure to Bitcoin. An investing standpoint yeah they're traded publicly too yep 425 million at like an average price of eleven thousand or something mm -hmm. so um, i'm not sure if all these gains <laughs> have uh incorporated into the share price or not but you would need someone to do fundamental analysis on the, the holdings of microstrategy to see what the intrinsic value of that stock is but i guarantee it's probably uh lower than what it's worth I believe yeah. last time I looked at that chart, it seemed like it got a bump when that news came out that they had put all their reserves into Bitcoin. I think that's just coming from the crypto community in general. Right. A lot of people still aren't paying attention. Nope. You know, we're approaching these all-time high numbers, and I don't see nearly the hype we saw at the end of 2017. Not even close. Yeah, that goes to the Google searches. If you look uh, now, we don't know if that's 100% a factor anymore because – but the Google problem is, is people could be uh, asking their friends or something like that. So they might not really Google about Bitcoin. But if you look at 2017 at that run up, there was like a tremendous amount of Google searches versus what's going on now. It kind of seems flat. And then if you look at that micro strategy thing, I think they bought in September, like uh, Michael Saylor was talking about it, how they basically bought like little by little all day long for like a week long process or something like that. And the price around September was in like the 140s. Then when that news came out, it went up to about $175 a share. Dipped down a little bit. But right now, MicroStrategy is going for a price around 217 a share. Mm. Up 15% this week. 
Yeah, it, it's definitely uh, and, and and it's got to be correlated to Bitcoin. There's no other way. I mean, yeah, the market's absolutely. down in general this week. I, I I don't really pay much attention to the traditional stock today, market. Today was I think a little flat. Uh, I think it was up like forty bucks, if if something like forty points or whatever like that. So it wasn't. But it, it was a pretty good week. I, I think yesterday was down, and then, but uh, overall not, the week is down. Okay. Last last week was the big pop up. Um, right. Okay. It actually finished lower than it started though. You had a big pop on that Monday, and then kind of steadily eroded a little bit till Friday, and we're kind of carrying that trend staying tight this week. Um. So. No, uh, that's always been um something. Friends of mine who are more educated, disciplined investors would look at is uh, the cash reserves of different corporations to invest in. A friend of mine loves Apple because they always have a ton of cash on hand. So it's a safer investment. You can see their wealth. They're a safe company. Um, and that's something that might start shifting in the future. People will be looking at what these companies use as their reserves. And, and Bitcoin might be a better option in the future. Potentially, if someone doesn't want to just own Bitcoin directly, that could be, like we said, kind of an indirect way to get exposure to Bitcoin. But you're also investing in a business that creates a product. I know that's um, something people have expressed to me. Like, what does Bitcoin do? It doesn't create anything. Like, Tesla makes cars. Apple makes phones. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I think it's interesting you see companies holding cash. I mean, if you ask any of us, you'd probably say that's a really bad idea to be holding massive amounts of cash. That's very irresponsible um, to do. Um, and There's I think a chart. That, maybe I'll look it up in a few minutes. I saw they did, um, I forget what they call it, but they use it to, to gauge inflation. It's like how many Big Macs you could buy with a particular asset or currency yeah. or whatever it is. And, um, they use that with Bitcoin compared to everything else, and it was hands down the best yeah. performer. It's funny we talk about all these new people coming into the space, and um, you know I've had been having conversations with people too who are new into it, and I usually start them out with the first question of asking them, "Do you know what the difference is between currency and money? Mm. What, what's the difference? Do you, do you guys know the difference? Uh, I hope so." Um, Currency is a medium of exchange. Money is also a medium of exchange, but the key characteristic trait with money is that it's also a store of value. Currency does not have a store of value. Currency is just, you know, as we know it, a piece of paper that's not backed by anything. There's nothing within that piece of paper that stores any anything. Uh, gold, gold is money. Gold stores its value within itself. It yes. could be used for industry, it could be used for jewelry or electronics, um, and it stores the work that was necessary to get it out of the ground and into a shiny coin. So that's why gold is money, and likewise, Bitcoin is money. Yeah. If I have a cash reserve, I don't want to be holding currency. I want to be holding money. No, especially with the inflation and uh, just there's no reason to at this point it's just it's expensive yeah. to probably hold cash yeah so for anyone listening i mean i would definitely make sure you, you have a solid understanding of the difference between currency and money right now, now jeff uh going back so what is your what is your uh personal uh not financial advice kind of uh oh, just what i'm doing how i'm looking at things like like are like if you're we're looking at it where even though now you what you know now let's say you had no bitcoin or whatever like what do you what are you doing well i mean the, the title of the episode is uh to fomo or not to fomo and what so is fomo just for these FOMO is fear, fear of missing out and in this context i'm thinking of fear of missing out on actually owning and controlling my own bitcoin Right. Not having it be in custody by anyone else. I have it. I control it. I can do with it what I wish, whenever I want, whatever I want. Um, and I, I do feel like potentially time might be running out to have that as an option, aside from maybe going to grayscale and paying a premium. Pretty handsome premium, too. Yeah. You see Stone Ridge is another one. They're buying up large amounts of Bitcoin. This I wanted to get to. This is Bitcoin leaving exchanges as holders prepare for bull run. People are removing their Bitcoin from exchanges and 
they're hanging on to it for the long term. Right. What's the long term mean? Anyone's guess, I suppose, but I have a feeling when you, the number keeps going up like we're really expecting it to. Yeah. Due to the four-year cycle, the current uh, financial climate, all these different factors you want to look at, they may never be sold. Right. Now, this, this is the kind of thing I feel like people would be investing in to, to leave it to their children because why would they leave them some money they don't know what will even be able to buy them one day? Yeah, That's kind of the way I'm looking at it. And then, uh, yeah, kind of wanted to bring you to the point that 10% of the entire supply of Bitcoin, not including the 20% no one can access. So this is another huge chunk of Bitcoin is owned by five mega exchanges. So these are the people you're going to have to go to in the future if you don't act now and take control of some of your own Bitcoin. You're going to have to go to a third party. Whereas right now you can go on an exchange and get it at the market price yourself and take control of it. Yeah, that's two so points. To me, um, when we brought up the topic for this episode, it was really just the, um, the actual supply of available Bitcoin to purchase and take ownership and control of is shrinking. And the amount of new Bitcoin being created is being absorbed by these mega exchanges faster than it's being created. Right. So I, I feel like one of these days, all of a sudden, people are going to be shocked by how fast the price went up because simple and demand there is no supply and people are going to be demanding this hard asset so that's kind of how i feel about it the fomo or not to fomo i mean that's up to uh everyone has to make their own decision of course but i'm happy that i already have a nice stack for myself like i am uh my allocation i think is the correct term yeah yeah i have it now i feel comfortable with that and i'm glad i do so now i don't have to worry like i get it now to, you know Right, right. I'm already set up. And you're not paying that eighteen thousand dollar premium right now, and who knows what it's going to be in another couple of months. Under hundred k, you're still early. I think so. I think so too. Yeah, definitely under twenty if you're under the all time high. Yeah. So you're you're a pro FOMO guy, huh? All FOMO. Myself, no my choice. I, if I, I did not own Bitcoin right now, I would be seriously. I would be wanting it right now. Yeah, I'd be salivating if I didn't already, like I said, have my uh, allocation already set up. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Awesome, man. So, 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 I'm gonna so Greg, what, do you, what do you think, Greg? How, how, how is your thought process on the two FOMO or not FOMO situation that's going on right now, especially with not even really the hype potentially that's coming out, but at some point it's, it's getting there, you know? See, CNBC is starting to cover it almost daily now, which, yeah, you know. I, I feel like I'm similar to Jeff is that like kind of my FOMO days are behind me um, mm -hmm. in regards to Bitcoin. Um, I'm pretty much all in when it comes to Bitcoin. <laughs> like I'm the type that will get a paycheck, pay my expenses, pay my monthly bills and anything remaining will go to Bitcoin. Um, because again, like I said earlier, I want my savings and whatever I hold to be into money and not in currency. Because um, the currency will continue to devalue as time goes on. Whereas money will at least hold its value with likelihood of increasing its currency denomination value. Yeah. Um, beyond that, I mean, Jeff talked about how people will be keeping their Bitcoin for their grandkids. And I say absolutely because it's not with the ability to lend off your Bitcoin. Um, you have an asset now that you could borrow money off of and you could lend it to other people. So there's no reason to even sell it anymore because I could have liquid funds transferred from my Bitcoin holdings. And that's where the whole DeFi phenomenon comes in. Right. So, what I've learned this year and is what wealthy people do is that they continually accumulate assets. And then when they need money or want money, they just borrow off their assets. Um, if you have a hundred thousand dollars of Apple stock, you can go to Chase Bank and make a deal with them to get a loan at a very low interest rate or a very competitive interest rate off your Apple shares. And in DeFi, you could do the same thing with Bitcoin. So 
there's no need to get rid of it or spend it just accumulate it um if i was not if i didn't own any bitcoin i don't know i would probably feel like it's too expensive and um uh, you know just a contrarian view i feel like it's just beyond me now i feel like it would be too much but as far as it continues to get growth, I don't think uh, it's it's necessary for the individual to even participate anymore. I feel yeah. like it's going to happen anyway. Uh, I read a quote that's, that everybody doesn't need to believe in this. Just anybody needs to believe in it. And I feel like we're already the ecosystem that's gonna drive it up. Um, I dollar cost average, and I'll always dollar cross average as long as I'm earning U.S. dollars. I don't see why I wouldn't continue buying this stuff. Uh, right. But yeah, I mean FOMO. It's not. It's not on my. It's not on my screen. Um, but uh, now, now even though you're saying the FOMO is not on your screen, you still dollar cost averaging, right? Yep. And you're, you're still putting whatever you can into it. Uh, that's going to be like interesting because, you know, at some point when let's say it does go to a point where it's a hundred thousand, let's just say 200,000, is there any point where you might look at it and go, well, maybe I'm not going to start putting in as much as I was because the price is so high that, you know, cause you look at it right now, we're, we're about 18,000. Um, so $180 gets you a million Satoshis. And if anybody doesn't know, uh, one Bitcoin equals a hundred million Satoshis because some people they look at it like 0. 0.0001 and it's like, no, just and and it. But I tell some people at work sometimes or wherever I said, listen, let's just say for instance, Bitcoin hits a million dollars, one penny equals one Satoshi, and they go, oh, like that, you know, a light bulb goes off. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if it like if the price does get certain value, like certain, you know crazy thing are are you going to start kind of scaling back the amount that you're actually putting into bitcoin no i no that absolutely not again i'm on i'm call it extreme or call it what not but i and it's not a popular opinion even amongst bitcoiners because i think we always are going to have competitive currencies and central banks are going to have currencies and things like that which is fine compete all you want but i have no true use case for holding any us dollars so like i said immediately as a, when i get us dollars i want to put it into bitcoin and from there i can assess what i'm buying what i'm spending what i'm investing in what i'm saving um and i'll strategize from there but i want to immediately get rid of my dollars um i have no desire to be a multi-millionaire in us dollars i want to have just as much bitcoin as i can and again I'll invest from there. I could create a collateral collateralized debt obligation or a loan off my Bitcoin as an asset. Yeah. And I'll get other assets from my Bitcoin because I'm actually a Swiss bank now. Right. I don't right, right. participate. Yeah, it's crazy. The dollar is going to zero. Not, a, that's not a popular opinion. Again, people think the dollar could be survive for decades from here and maybe it will, but it's definitely going to continue to lose its value. And, yeah. With everything going on, they're printing trillions and trillions of dollars. It's crazy. In October alone, there was a quarter trillion dollar deficit. Just October, quarter trillion dollar deficit. How does that get paid? It doesn't. Does, it does. It does get paid. Wow. It gets paid from your salary and it gets paid from your savings in dollars. So as long as you're getting paid in dollars and you have savings in dollars, that's how deficits get paid. It's an indirect tax from your back pocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no politician needs approval. No but, politician needs approval or Congress approval. They just press print and you're getting taxed. Out of yeah, your back no, I, I totally agree with you. It's it's just an indirect way of taxing people, and that's and, yeah. and, and the worst part is is most like when you get taxed, you see it. You know when you like like it not like you know so like you you, you pay income tax or even. If you go to the stores and, you know, you, you see like on your bill, like you go to restaurants, 8.6% tax. Yep. You, 
you know it's there. It shows you how much you're paying. But when they're printing the money, you don't really know how much you're really being taxed. You be, you know, and that's exactly. So yeah, we, exactly. And that, I mean, that's where it comes to like seeing this eighteen thousand dollar price. Um, I don't care. I don't care about the eighteen thousand dollar price. Um, you, you're hearing a lot of people. The stock market's up. Um, real estate industry's up. Uh, the, the my house is worth so much more. I'm like, just the dollars are worth less. The right. Dollars are worth less. It costs more that. dollars to buy a share of Apple. Apple hasn't come out with anything crazy new, uh, new technology. I mean, what new has any of these stocks created? to deserve any type of increase. They haven't done anything. Yeah. Uh, the Bitcoin price, I mean, I just see dollars losing their purchasing power. Right, um, and it's not just dollars too. It's it's all currency throughout the globe, no matter where you are, all places, whether it's the Euro, the Yuan, whatever, the, um, you know, some pesos or whatever yeah. you're seeing it all across in certain certain places you get the hyperinflation where it's it's going insane you know there, there's certain countries like venezuela they're they're using bitcoin because at least they know bitcoin even if the bitcoin price like when bitcoin was in 2017 and they were buying let's say bitcoin at twenty thousand dollars they would rather have had bitcoin at twenty thousand dollars have it drop to three thousand dollars and hold that than hold the the money that they had there the, was it a bully bars or something like that or yeah uh, yeah so, so why would why why would you you know so and this is these are there's a lot of countries that are doing this, mm -hmm. and like you said, the United States, the U.S. dollar is is doing the same thing. Obviously, it's not as bad, and people aren't seeing it as much. But I think that's know, probably the best way to look at it. Like the U.S. dollar may be the least bad of all the currencies, right? Because it's a global currency too. We're at zero percent interest rates here, but in many European countries and other places around the world, there are negative interest rates. It's just the to global, try to keep their economies functioning and keep velocity of money going. It's the global reserve currency is the U.S. dollar, right? right. So, you know, that's a that's a popular counter argument I'll get from other people is, um, you know, Japan has been negative interest rates or Europe's been negative interest rates or these other countries have this GDP ratio that's extremely high, and I'm like, yeah, but they're not the world reserve currency you realize that all international trade, 80% of it settles in the U.S. dollar. That's, That's tricky too, though, because what I've learned is um, the internationally settled debts that the U.S. dollar is used, they call that the euro dollar, which is not fungible or interchangeable with the dollars that we use as Americans domestically. They're completely different. That's interesting. So I'm not even sure. It's, it's such a confusing system, which is why I like Bitcoin. You could look at the blockchain. You could see the supply. How much is being created? It can't be changed. Right. Who knows what even goes on behind closed doors and these secret meetings and deals that are made? I don't, have no idea. What even exists? You know, it's all anonymous and not open to audits. So <laughs> that's a big, big problem. Watching. But uh, if we keep up these deficit spending, deficit spending, and all this money printing. I mean, it, there has to be a finish line, right? <laughs> it, it, I was just watching a video uh, from uh, George Gammon, if anyone's interested in a good YouTube channel, a guy who kind of explains the economy, money, um, very informative, very easy to follow. But he was talking about the implications of a debt jubilee. Um, and he said it was like, essentially he just said it would just lead to, that, that's what would lead to hyperinflation in the United States. So it sounds good that they would erase all the debt, but it it would just it would just destroy everything in the economy. The currency would have no value anymore right. because you just deleted all the debt. What do you even need it? In? You know, I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, it's I don't know the end game for the debt, but like any of the scenarios I've realistically tried to look into that might happen, none of them are appealing. That that would make me want to, like you said, park my wealth in in the dollar. Yeah, like the mon modern monetary whatever. MMT, yeah, MMT, and that's what it is. It's just a theory. Like we hope this works, and it seems to just keep kicking the can down the road. And I guess more like rolling a, a snowball down a mountain it keeps getting yeah. bigger. It just hasn't hit anything yet. That's what I'm saying. I don't know who you need to shake, but you don't need no MMT. You have Bitcoin. It the technology exists. We can go back to a sound money, which yeah. will allow us to go back to sound principles, right? Um, 
which I, that's that's the way I look at um the Bitcoin that I do hold. Kind of like we were talking about with micro strategy. I view it as my own reserve now. And they're talking about making new digital currencies, central bank digital currencies, the digital US dollar, euro, all these different things. Go ahead. I was reading an interesting article that because Bitcoin exists, it's going to make these currencies compete for which one we will use to transact in, which one's going to be best instead of just, you know, we're here in America, you got to use the dollar. That's it. You don't have a choice. Yep. So that'll be interesting to see play out too. Hopefully it goes that way. It's it's going to go that way. It's already in the works. We, we know that it's in the works. They IMF came out in October and talked about it publicly. Oh, great reset. Yeah. It's on their website. No, they, the central big digital currencies, it's, it's all out there. It's all coming. So whether you're not ready for it or not, it's coming. And just know you have an option out of it in Bitcoin and other, other digital assets, you know, cryptocurrencies, digital assets, whatever you want to call them. Um, you don't have to play their game. Uh, you have an option. At its core to me, that's Bitcoin is a choice. At least it gives me a choice. Yep. Really in its essence. I wanted to touch on too, you mentioned you don't, you don't have any use for keeping your wealth in, uh, in dollars. I was never a good saver. I am a brainwashed, trained consumer American. As soon as I get money, what can I get with it? I want to pay my bills and I want to get the next thing. Yep. Um, as soon as I started buying Bitcoin, I, I mean, nothing so far. And I've been through some tighter uh, financial little moments here and there. I found another way. It's the first thing in my life I've encountered that turned me into a saver. Yep. Especially savings. as I watch the price go up. So my savings are expanding if you look at it in U.S. dollar terms, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so uh, it actually, Bitcoin uh, changed my mindset about how I, I look at and um, handle money and think about money. Yeah, a popular phrase is calling it savings technology, right? It's mm -hmm. Bitcoin is savings technology, which makes a lot of sense. Um, because, yeah, I mean, for with currency as your savings, you're losing it if you hold it. So you want to spend it, get rid of it, you know, take on risky investments or just spend it. And uh, the way industries work is they know that you want to spend it and get rid of it. And and keep things going. So that's why your refrigerator only lasts five years now <laughs> compared to back in the 60s or 50s when your money was actually money backed by something like gold. Um, people had to make products that lasted long because for you to release your, your money, you wanted a product that would last as long as your money would, right? So refrigerators in the 60s would last like 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> like the tanks <laughs> it's, it's funny how you say that because uh I, I work in uh you know power plant industry and uh I've, I've dealt with some electrical breakers or you know high voltage equipment where you see stuff that was built in the 50s and stuff like that and it's still you so some of the stuff was still being used you know 50 60 years later and it's still great works great no issues nothing nothing wrong with it I mean, when you pull these breakers out, like these, these, they, they're solid. I mean, these things, like they, they're yeah. like, a, it's like a truck built into this small area. And then you see the new technology that comes out that's supposedly better and safer. It's like plastic. It's light. It breaks all the time. There's, there's always issues. You, before you even put the equipment in, they got issues with the stuff. And it's like, wow, like, like you said, the, the, the way that they built things, Back then, you would think we're we're improving our technology. They're just getting cheaper with the the stuff and the parts and everything that they're putting into it. Exactly, so, quality goes down. Right. You yeah. Know? And you could expand that into all different areas of life. I mean, when was the last time you had someone bag their groceries at a grocery store? You know, even the the service, the quality of service goes down. When did you yeah. have an When did you have an usher walk you down the aisle of a movie theater and show you your seat? Like, you know. This, they have to cut it costs from everywhere and it comes out of the service and the quality of the product. Yeah, I mean, now that uh, you go to supermarkets, so luckily sometimes I used to actually, I shop at uh, ShopRite where uh, they actually sometimes do have before pre COVID, they used to actually have people that did bag your stuff. And I used to like go in there because when I had little kids with me, it was very hard to shop, pay attention to my kids and bag my stuff at the same time, you know, 
Mm -hmm. Um, but then you go to other places, like you go to Lowe's and you go to, uh, purchase your stuff and it's everything's self checkout. And I'm like, I got a, a, like all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't I have to enter the UPC in. And then even if you go to the supermarkets too, you go in there, you got like a vegetable and it's like, I don't even know how to ring up my vegetable. Like, I don't know, two, two, zero, like, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But the vegetable just pack, don't even buy it. You don't need vegetables. You you'll people. notice. Yeah, you'll <laughs> notice a bag of chips even is feels a little emptier than it used to be. You know, because you know they got to keep the same price. They want to keep that consumer price index level. So the way they do that is just by removing yep. quality of service and quality of product yeah. by still shaping it the same way. Um, so, but eventually that game's gonna cross over and the prices will start going up along with the degradation of quality and service. I mean, even though with the supermarket, they, they, cause I, I usually, I was a big plastic bag person cause for plastic bags, I would always use them. I have a dog, right? I, I pick up my dog's uh, poop with, with the bag. I have like, I used to use diapers. I used to throw that into the diaper, you know, the diapers in there or something like that. Uh, when I have like, you know, trash bins, I use the plastic bags from the grocery store. Yeah. Now they're getting rid of plastic. They're yep. using paper, but the paper, they want, if you want a paper bag, they're charging you like 20 cents a bag. Great it's example. Bag. Yeah. Great you know? example. Exactly what we're talking about. And I'm just like, oh, so now I have to buy my own bags and bring bags in there. Mm-hmm. But then at the same time, I still need plastic bags. So right. now I got to go on Amazon and order bags to my house for my, for my trash receptacles where I was getting bags and using them and recycling them it's because they're like oh we're doing this because plastic bag and i'm like listen i get it plastic <laughs> is good or bad. I, I, whatever but i still need it i'm still going to use it and i'm using it for more than just carrying my groceries yeah you got to look at what it saves the supermarkets and stuff like that to not have plastic bags anymore which i mean it's got to be a nice chunk to keep prices kind of you know level for another year <laughs> yeah, yeah don't have to boost things up another five ten cents or whatever across i didn't know where you were uh, actually going with that plastic bag story at first matt i was like is he actually gonna start talking about dog poop in this bitcoin podcast right now but you did you did make a good point so i'm glad yeah. you saved that one before i interrupted it's, it's a great point that i probably ignored i'm still hanging on to like ushers at the movie theater like really old ones but that's yeah, it a- is a good point it's um Michael Saylor's talked about how Bitcoin represents all these different things. It's a store of value, but it's a storage of other things too. It's a storage of energy that was consumed yeah. to find the Bitcoin. For myself personally, it was a storage of like, I mentioned in the last podcast, most of the money I put into it was while I was working at the Bordia Airport. All that was shift six days a week. It wasn't a pleasant experience, but I was making a lot of money. All that energy I put into that airport, I basically transferred into Bitcoin. And now I still have that Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. It's a better way for me to kind of look at my time that I spent there, that I wasn't kind of just spinning my wheels and working and working and working and working. I still have that Bitcoin. And now, um, well, I'm, I'm grateful I made that choice. That energy now is stored for me, myself, in, in the form of that wealth. And made me think of it when you were describing the quality of the refrigerator and that you were talking about the equipment you work with. Um, it meant something to part with a portion of your wealth for a product back then. And... Yeah. Um, I don't think I'm the only one these days that when you get you get some cash, you're just like, whatever. I just like, whatever. Plus, yeah. how much? I don't care. Give me that, you know. It so, changes the whole psychology of it when you have a sound money. And I mean, there's books on this stuff about what it was lo- what the mentality was like spending your money back decades and decades ago when it was actually backed by gold. And maybe you guys have grandparents who are a little bit more stingy. I mean, they did... The great, there. I guess for all of us, it was the greatest generation, right? The ones who lived through the depression and yeah. um, they went through the whole gold shock of removing the gold. And they were very kind of stingy people that generation because they knew that you got to give me something good. I'm not releasing my money. Um, give me a good product. Give me good service. If not, you're not getting nothing from me. Whereas yeah. our generation, we seem to be, you know, way more free with spending. Oh yeah. And their attitudes would get you get a job when you're young, you stay working for the same company, you move up in the company, you earn a pension, you, you'll have a secure retirement. It barely exists anymore. Oh, yeah. I remember my grandparents would, you know, talk to me about those kind of things. Um, and I, I would just be looking at them like they had three heads. I didn't say anything to my grandparents. I didn't right. want to insult them or get smacked with the wooden spoon either. <laughs> but um, those things just didn't exist anymore. And they didn't 
quite grasp that. And it's sad. Yeah. And they you know, definitely so people get left like purposeless, just working, working a job temporarily. You, you just move on to the better deal all the time. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I mean, if that's the environment we live in, it's good that Bitcoin exists because at least you have something you can lean on to store the fruits of your labor, so to speak. Right. You know? And it's also an appreciation of, of money. And um, like, you know, a lot of these, a lot of people today are, are growing up very privileged. And this is, you know, they have so much more than people had back then. You know, I see like kids that are 13 years old, they have a thousand dollar smartphone in their pocket. And it's just like, man, you know, I didn't even have a, a bike that was worth near anything worth that, you know, and I actually had a, work and work and pay for that bike with my own money where you know people are being just these kids are getting bought whatever they want and they don't really appreciate they don't a lot of kids don't work now you know it's it's a lot of people that are like you don't go anywhere and see like young people working so it's just it's definitely uh different an 11 year old you said yeah or 13 years old or whatever you know like young kids I what babies, year? babies with tablets that are more powerful than the computers they used to land on the moon in the 60s what year were you 13 1996 same 1996 so yeah i got my Avenue. was that the last uh, year we were at sycamore avenue Matt? i think that no, was 96 uh, no, that was 95 but 96 oh. was uh our first year in high school high, and um i got my first computer at 13 on AOL with 28K modem, dial up, you know. So it's it different, yeah. different, different times. Well, I asked you that because uh, 600 bucks is what a thousand bucks is today in 1996. $600. So you yeah. saw like a 40% inflation um, eat away at the value, purchasing power value of that money. What was the price of Bitcoin in 96? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Magic. Uh, so, so going back to um, you know, circle around back to Greg, where you know, to FOMO or not to FOMO. What what is your if you're a person that even from your perspective, let's say right now, not let's say pretend you have zero Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Like what what are you what are you doing right now? What are you looking at? Well, if I have zero Bitcoin, how do you like? How am I coming across Bitcoin? You know, what my, you the news, you got friends maybe or something like that. Yeah. Okay. You know, so yeah, let me put myself in the perspective of my friends because, uh, you know, uh, my hometown group of friends, right? I guess there's six of us. Um, four of us are Bitcoiners. Two of them are not. And I actually asked the question the other day and um, one of them was just kind of like, I don't got nothing, but I'm rooting for you guys. Like I'm rooting for you guys. I'm, I'm still going to play uh, basically the standard Standard game contributes to 401k and um, hopefully job works out, 401k works out and uh, just keep going. So um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if the FOMO is even there. I mean, I'm sure we're coming across of the uh, Google trends for Bitcoin is still like at an all time, not an all time low, but it's not showing any blips of life as far as Google trends go. So I'm not even sure if FOMO is there. I think this is purely institutional, followed by all the people that know about it already. Um, no, it my seems perspective- bizarre to me at this point that there is not any any mania or hype going on. It, it seems a little bizarre to me, like the calm before the storm kind of a cliche, you know? Yeah, I mean, as a person from, I guess, the class of 2013, I mean, I was there in 2016, and the vibes are a lot, very similar in a way. I mean, definitely... You feel way better about it, but as far as watching that price creep up to the previous all-time high um, with not a lot of noise, that's how 2016, early 2017 was. So be interested to see the real FOMO come in um, next next year, um, especially when we break the previous all-time high. Like we got to get across 20K first and – I think it's going to be all over the place. Um, So I think the FOMO discussion might happen again for real sometime next year. Yeah. Yeah, Not so much right now. So so I was going to say is like my perspective looking at you, even though you're um, into Bitcoin or whatever already, but because you basically are looking to put any extra fiat or whatever into Bitcoin, 
you're basically already in full FOMO mode, even if you know it or not, just because you love um, everything about it, the asset, you, you know what I'm saying? So like, just, just like my perspective of you is like, you're, you're full kind of almost full FOMO in the sense that like, you feel like there's nothing else that's better than this in your personal opinion. Cause this is like a hard asset where there's like, like, as opposed to like, let's say there's anything else, like let's say even Tesla or, or some other stuff, like you're not even really, I mean, maybe you are, I, are you looking at any other stocks or anything that you kind of have an opinion on? I mean, you, definitely for sure. Um, you know, I'm attracted to the winning networks. Um, right. Those are what appealing to me the most, um, whether it's Google, as far as the, 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 the dominant network of search engines or Amazon as the dominant network for re retail, um, Airbnb, the dominant for hotels, uh, Uber, dominant network for taxi cabs. We could go on, right? There's, there's winners, the network winners. I'm very attracted to all the ones that, that are in the lead for as far as networks are concerned. Bitcoin's the leading network for decentralized money. Um, so I, uh, again, that's where I like to start. If I get paid in dollars still. I would love to be paid in Bitcoin, but I'm paid in dollars. So my mental thing is get that into Bitcoin right away and we'll think about investments from there. Um, I'm not aware of any way to get um, Bitcoin into the stock market, but again, I can create a collateralized debt, debt, debt obligation with my Bitcoin, get at least some type of USD stable coin, which I could transfer out for cash and then invest into the stock market. So there are ways to do it. Um, but again, I'm, I'm just waiting for the launch, <laughs> the rocket launch up to hundred K next year. Oh, it's going to happen. And you know, I just don't know when, but like you said, and I think it's just like, um, what, you know, put your money with where you're most an expert at or what you most believe in. And, uh, diversification is cool, but if you're really into something, um, you should follow what you know. And yeah, I feel like I feel like I know Bitcoin better than I know Tesla or anything else. So yeah, um, yeah. that's where I'm placing my chips. I'm not a big fan of diversification. I think you're good with like one to three things and stick with that. Mm -hmm. Nice. I, I definitely like the take on that. In terms of um, <clears throat> you just mentioned like using your Bitcoin to trade stocks or, or whatever you might have been alluding to. I know there's a platform that exists now. We can't use it technically in America. Um, but you can like trade gold futures and certain stocks. So some of these things are coming. Yeah. yeah. So, so definitely you could wrap your Bitcoin and make a WBTC. You could lend your WBTC on MakerDAO, which is a 4% interest rate um, at 150% debt collateralized debt obligation. Um, so you could get DAI from MakerDAO, go to Gemini, a U.S., New York approved exchange, sell your die for cash, and now you have cash that you could use to invest in the stock market. Can you explain what die is briefly? Die is a stable coin that's built on Ethereum. Uh, basically, people lend Ethereum to this platform to produce die. So it's actually a money that's a currency um, that's backed by Ethereum that you could use and it's soft pegged to the dollar so it's usually a little bit more like one a few cents more than a dollar um but it's stable to the dollar so um you, and it's collateralized by ethereum as like the hard asset behind it collateralized by ethereum but MakerDAO also has other digital currencies that's why i mentioned wbtc wrapped bitcoin wrapped bitcoin is an option they have chain link they have um a slew of others you'd have to go on the MakerDAO platform and, you see all the different vaults you could create on the and so i could deposit my bitcoin as collateral and get some of this stable coin die to transact in, in in various other ways you'd have to wrap your bitcoin first using uh, wbtc or ren btc um those are different uh wrapping methods um and from there you could take your wrapped bitcoin and create a vault on maker dow um to create a uh CDO, collateralized debt obligation. <laughs> so I guess slew of words. 
go back to the um, our previous podcast number two. Uh, you did kind of get into some of this stuff with uh, MakerDAO mm-hmm. and basically De- DeFi and, and stuff like that. So exactly. if you guys check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it all comes back to, I don't want to spend my Bitcoin, but I will lend it or allow people to borrow it off it so that I could generate interest or I could take a cash value from it without ever selling it. And that's what the wealthy do. <laughs> they buy yeah. properties, they rent them. They'll take their million dollars worth of Apple's stock and go into Chase Bank and get a loan off that and buy more Apple stock. <laughs> like you, you, This is what they do. So don't spend your assets. Keep collecting them. Leverage them, yeah. Leverage them, yeah, exactly. All right. So, all right, I guess uh, at that point, I'll, I'll go into how I feel to FOMO or not to FOMO. And right now, I mean, I'm looking at it, the price is – hanging at 18,000. So as somebody that didn't have any, I would definitely be looking at it like, wow, that, that, that's a lot of money. So most people that don't know about Bitcoin, they're looking at it and going $18,000. Like I don't have $18,000. And most people, what they don't realize is that at $18,000, um, you could still buy a partial Bitcoin, right? So People don't understand. Most people that don't understand that they go, oh, you know, I don't have. Um, I think there's a thing called the term called like crypto vanity, where it's the term of just kind of like owning one of something. So let's just say, for instance, right now, uh, people go on and they go on a PayPal because most people that are new to crypto, they might have paypal account already and they see it's available what they don't realize is they're not really technically owning the asset in the sense of that they can withdraw it and actually have self-custody which is basically the whole point of cryptocurrency in themselves so they look at that they see bitcoin at eighteen thousand dollars right they see ethereum it's 486 litecoin 81 dollars even ethereum classic six dollars right so they see all these things and they go all right, I got I got like five thousand dollars, and I can get you know point two two Bitcoin or whatever, or I can get you know ten you know Ethereum or you know a bunch of Litecoin basically. So I think what you're seeing now right now with people is is the price why what Litecoin is going up is you're seeing these people that maybe they got a hundred bucks. And they go, $100, man, that's getting me not even like a hundredth of a Bitcoin. You know, it's getting me even less than that. And they go, that's like, looks like nothing. So they probably don't even want to buy it. Because when they go to hit the, the, the buy button, they see this is how much you're going to get. And they go, oh, uh, that's like nothing. So they look at Litecoin. They go, well, I can get a whole Litecoin. It's a cryptocurrency, right? Oh, it, it was almost at $300. That would like triple, you know, triple, almost quadruple uh, my cash that I had, you know, originally. So let me, let me buy that. So that's why I feel like you see Litecoin running up, even Ethereum Classic. If you notice that it's been getting these big, like hard runs, were up and down, you know, up. Even though it got hacked twice recently. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of Ethereum <laughs> Classic, even though I understand the principle behind it. I think, like, even if I own any, it's so small that, like, if it just got wiped out, I wouldn't really care. You know, it's literally like my lunch money or something like that. Yeah, but, um, to confirm what you're saying, I mean, I, one of the FOMO friends I have had reach out to me was asking me, you know, about Litecoin. It was, right. Bitcoin wasn't even on his radar. It was, yeah. you know, uh, I'm thinking about buying, you know, a handful of Litecoin. You know, what do you think? <laughs> and I'm like, well, have you looked at the um, chart of Litecoin to Bitcoin? Because that's what you got to do. And to anyone else listening out there, you have to make sure you are looking at the pair of whatever digital asset compared to Bitcoin because it's right. typical to, for Bitcoin to be outperforming um, drastically against those other pairs. Um, so just because it's a lower price doesn't mean it's going to receive the best return. Right. So, and, and maybe in a, if you can, um, while, while I'm talking, maybe you can find some of those charts and pull some of them up. So, yeah, I have one right now if you want. Yeah, if, yeah definitely. Let's, let's just take a look at that because – you know, that, that's something like I actually had some Litecoin, uh, 
you know, I still, I still have Litecoin. I don't think I'm getting rid of all of it, but I, I actually converted some of that to Bitcoin because I just looked at some of those charts and I said, you know what, if I'm looking, comparing it to Bitcoin and not dollars, it's not really doing that well. I mean, it, you know, compared to where it was. So you, you see a lot of people doing that. That's, that's one thing. Then if, um, you know, so that that's one thing I, I tell everybody is if if you're gonna buy it, definitely just buy Bitcoin and, and at least have a majority of everything in Bitcoin because Bitcoin has that first mover advantage. Most people that you know they just love like most people that are into crypto, it's either Bitcoin or nothing for a lot of people. Now I'm not one of those people, even though I have I'm a big believer in Bitcoin and most of everything is about Bitcoin. So I'm not gonna even deny those people what they believe, but let's just before we go into that let's see if we pull up that chart right now yeah that, that. just i just need to allow to be able to screen share so oh. uh yeah you know anyway so we're going to uh that the thing is about bitcoin too is there is only going to be 21 million out there as jeff was saying a lot of them are lost or whatever the case is like that also you got a lot of people that own a lot of that so if you leave it for the common retail person, there's not much out there for them to have, right? And there are more millionaires, as I say, than there are actually Bitcoin out there. So if every millionaire bought one Bitcoin each, there isn't even enough for that. So going now to here, if you look, Greg's showing the chart right here. So this is Litecoin to USD on a weekly chart. Each candle represents a week. Oh, uh, a week. So you could see against the US dollar, we're having a nice breakout here which looks great. Like, yeah. you know, if, if this is what you're looking at, it's going to be profitable. Um, but let's look at the Litecoin compared to Bitcoin pair on a weekly chart. It's a little different. The yeah. overall trend is way down. Right. You're having a nice little breakout here. But I mean, as far as the, you know, the safe play, if you're going to take money and put it into something, the safest play is into Bitcoin. Because Litecoin compared to Bitcoin is way down. Right. And, and the thing, too, is about Litecoin, uh, for people who don't know, where we were just discussing the uh, amount in circulation, Bitcoin actually, I mean, Litecoin, I'm sorry, has a, a four to one ratio on Bitcoin. So there's, I think, 84 million is, is the number. There's 84 million Litecoin out there versus 21 million Bitcoin. And now there's a, there's a comparison on Litecoin where they say Litecoin is kind of like, the silver to Bitcoin as gold, you know, maybe, maybe it's not. And also Litecoin does have value in the sense that I'm not sure about it now, but back in the day, they used to use Litecoin kind of as an experimental network for Bitcoin. So if they were to do something for the Bitcoin network, they could run on a Litecoin network first, see if it works. And if it does work, then they would, I guess, implement it on the Bitcoin network. Yep. So you know, I, like I said, I like Litecoin, but there are some people that may just go and I'm going to put all my money into Litecoin, take a chance on that, not buy any Bitcoin. And that's kind of where I feel like uh, people are going to be making a mistake on that. Right. And, and again, here's another chart. This is Ethereum <laughs> compared to Bitcoin. Um, yeah. Overall downtrend is the trend is down. <laughs> um, right. And I mean, the ultimate chart for this is the Bitcoin dominance chart, right? So... Bitcoin dominance chart is trending up. Yeah. So if you're going to put money in this and you're new and you're a rookie, like for God's sakes, just, just buy Bitcoin. If you're a trader and you're looking for opportunities to, to make a little profit and hopefully put that profit back into Bitcoin, then that's, that's fair game. As you saw with the Litecoin and USD chart, Litecoin looks great against USD right now. Um, I think that's an important point, and that's something I've started thinking. Maybe in the last year and a half or so, I started thinking more in growing Bitcoin, growing my amount of Bitcoin I have, not the U.S. dollar amount I have. Yep. Because when I was trying to grow the dollar amount of my portfolio, I would notice actually the Bitcoin amount would get lower sometimes. Yep. Um, exactly. It's an interesting way to think of it. I mean, over time, the three of us at least are very confident. Over time, the price of Bitcoin in U.S. dollars is going to go up. So if you're increasing the amount of Bitcoin you have by trading or whatever method you use, and it's going to go up in the price of U.S. dollars, that's like really get that exponential growth then. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know? 
Absolutely. I mean, when you're speaking trade, about trading, Litecoin um, in, the, in the context of FOMO, if I could go back and talk to myself when I FOMO'd in, I started with Litecoin because it was cheaper. <clears throat> um, and I FOMO'd in. I didn't do research. I started buying any shit coin I, I saw that was dirt cheap because I thought it would go to a dollar or whatever. Get rich right. quick dreams. If I had taken the time to learn, dollar cost averaged in, I would be in a much better position today than I already am. Yep. Right. Now, the thing is, too, like, I could, I could see why some people might look at certain altcoins in the sense of uh, making uh, larger gains because, you know, if you look at a market cap on some of these coins and it's really low, and if this thing takes off, you could really definitely make a lot of money on something. You know, I, but the problem is, is it might shoot up and then it, boom, just dumps right out. Like, so you, you got to be careful with that. Where Gambling. Right. Because, like, if you have a lower market cap, the potential for some whale could just come in and dump everything. He can just destroy that thing in a second. So yeah. versus where something maybe where in Bitcoin where something has a larger market cap, there's less of a chance of it being as volatile. And as the market cap for Bitcoin uh, gets higher and higher and higher, that potential for seeing those really – big dumps where it drops like 30 40 percent because I, I i don't remember what it was but there was one day that it actually dropped like some ridiculous amount in one day or one one basically you know one candlestick like boom just like you know yeah. it's good for that to happen yeah I, th I think that's you know people who get into litecoin or all those things it's just because they haven't had that mental switch yet about accumulating bitcoin they're yeah. still trying to accumulate dollars and they just want more dollars right and right Again, you shouldn't think of your savings to be in currency. Your savings should be in money. So right. um, just be careful of that. Um, what else am I looking at? Oh, I didn't want to, I don't want to bash altcoins or other digital assets. I have a, personally, I have, I have a position in Ethereum. Um, right. it's, it's not nowhere near as big as my Bitcoin position, but my thought with Ethereum is, is that it's basically like owning an index of all altcoins. All so at least i have some of that i believe in the space i believe in the future of all this so i do have a position in that as well right and, and the thing too is with ethereum is not only is this um basically the major altcoin but there are so many altcoins that are built on that network and that's what people don't yeah. understand like that's why it's like an index right so if ethereum if ethereum gets wiped for some reason not only are you going to see ethereum crash but you're going to see all these other uh all coins that are basically built on that network just die down too so right that's kind of the importance of that network yep so you know because you have like you said defi um and, and, and i mean it, there's just so many things that are built up to that and it it's an amazing like like to me I, i'm a, I'm a fan of the network and, and everything like that but it's still not bitcoin it's not the same thing and people need to look at it as and stop comparing the two like yeah it's a totally different thing i i, I Bitcoin is a naturally occurring resource in nature that is now money. Um, yeah. Ethereum is an actual industry. It's a new industry being created and built on. Yeah. So it's completely two separate things. Right. And, and people need to separate the two when they're, cause some people are like, you know, Bitcoin maximalists kind of shit all over uh, Ethereum, but it's like, well, they're separate. They're, they're not. They're, yeah, it's yeah. completely two different like camps, and you, it's yeah. it's hard to get your mind over that. But that's where you gotta gotta get to. You and then and too, there's a lot of tribalism. That's that's a you know something that people need to get away from because you know you, you should all kind of just be sort of on a same team in some ways because you know you guys are, most people are probably trying to look to just improve everything and make things better and you know. Especially with current, like current, you know, money, as they say, make money better. And that's, that's something, you know, that, that you're looking at. And, um, you know, as you said, like Bitcoin, to me, it definitely is a savings account because uh, you have something like that. There's no, there's no cost to store Bitcoin too. People need to understand that. Like, you know, back sometimes when people had money, you know, banks might charge you to hold money. And especially if uh, interest rates do go negative, they will charge you to store your money there. Yep. But if you have Bitcoin, there, no, there's nobody to charge you anything to, to store it. It's just storing. Yeah, I think banks will go back to their original use case as a custodian. And they're right. supposed to, you know, if you're not too comfortable with holding your Bitcoin and you're someone lucky enough to have a, 
you know, a lot of it, then maybe you would want some assistance. You know, maybe you're an older generation, you're just used to having that banking relationship. And I do see a use case for banks in the future to be that custodian um, yeah. for whoever wants to use that. Um, you know, back in the day, you had your paper currency receipts to get your gold from the bank. And you were comfortable with storing your gold at that bank because they had good security. And yeah. that, was, that was the relationship. You chose what bank you wanted to bank with. And I think that will become a thing again. Yeah, with uh, basically, like you said, uh, the banks kind of storing crypto or whatever like that for people, especially people that maybe they don't want that responsibility of having some money or whatever, or even if for any reason you want to set up a trust fund for somebody like that, you can maybe have custodial services where if something happens to you, um, you know, your, your children can basically uh, have things set up for them uh, as they, you know, get older and, you know, you don't have to worry about basically showing somebody like, Oh, this is how you access my information. This is how you, you know, it's, it's, here's a paper, piece of paper with my seed phrase. And yeah, there's my wealth. Like, what? Like, you know, <laughs> and, and it's crazy. Cause you think about it, like probably like nine or maybe even more than that nine out of 10 people or more would be like, what is this? I, I don't understand it. You know? So that that's where I think that banks or certain companies might should go in that direction. You know, it's not for everybody, obviously, because if you're good and you trust yourself, or whatever, then you should be able to just hold your own keys and not worry about that, you know? And then going back to that too, is like where it can build generational wealth in the sense where if you have Bitcoin, you know, they can, you can pass it on to your children and they can hold on to it and then they can pass it on to their kids because it's a limited asset. There's so many people in this world, but there's only so many Bitcoin and it's not as, you know, it's an I'm, asset. It's an right. asset, just like real estate. I mean, that's generational wealth is owning assets. Yeah. So Bitcoin yeah. is a digital asset. I think it's important to touch on too. You said, Greg, um, if you, I forget the context, you even said it in, but you use the phrase, a lot of Bitcoin. If you have a lot of Bitcoin, mm. that's kind of a relative term. And as time goes on, the amount of Bitcoin that will be considered a lot is going to get smaller and smaller. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You don't need to buy a whole Bitcoin. You don't need to. And, you know, uh, and I don't think at a certain point, the working class people like ourselves will not be able to. I don't think in the too distant future. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it's um, like, don't sneer. If you see like 0.1 Bitcoin, don't say like, what am I going to do with a tenth of a Bitcoin? Yeah, for sure. Well, Because um, if you're yeah. just you're thinking more in percentages and that like it's that storage of wealth and storage of so many other things. Um, the yep. value is we, we can only guess at the value but it's going to be very valuable if yeah you can't own that full one you know yeah i mean and also to speak of the future i mean uh you know i'm talking all this 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 talk right now but who knows what's going to happen to my psychology when you know it goes to prices that are beyond my emotional uh, endurance you know what am i what am i going to do people will sell when it gets to higher prices they just you know and rightfully so, like maybe buy yourself something, like enjoy life a little bit. You know, you're right. gonna spend some. Um, so people who have a lot um, will probably spend some time in the future, um, and which allows the smaller- I think it'd be better to view it as, yeah, a tool you could use, like you said, like real estate or an asset to leverage to- Yeah, that's a where the- financial they, tool, not, not just money to spend as a currency. You know? And that's where the education of how to act like a wealthy person comes into play because it's really you know you don't want to spend your assets you want to borrow off your assets and use that to spend up from so learning that is kind of giving me the security to say no matter what the price goes i won't be selling right right <clears throat> are we fomoing or are we not fomoing oh well i'm 100 percent in i mean that <laughs> that's been my my mindset, the way I look I at think it. It's a good, and I mentioned George Gavin earlier. He mentioned in um, the Jet Do the Debt Jubilee video I watched. It might be better to look backwards instead of forwards. And I, like I said, I think that's probably if anyone was going to listen to my message. My message to myself when I first started was: be patient, take the time to learn. Don't go chasing quick profits everywhere. Understand the technology and what it really means first. Um, Definitely. And don't let greed take over. 
Absolutely. Education in this space is everything. And it's actually its biggest, its biggest hurdle is education. You know, um, people work all year long for currency. Um, what we call money. Most of them, it's not money. We should know that by now. Um, they work all year to earn money, but they don't spend one hour out of that year to learn what money is or why other forms of money are better than the one that they're earning. So take that hour, learn what money is. And if you read books like the Bitcoin standard by um, Saifedean Amos, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. I think but, I gave uh, that to my brother or I pull it off the shelf right now and check. Yeah, but all those books, Bitcoin books, uh, they usually start out with discussing what money is and the evolution of money and where it came from and the different forms of money that took place throughout the centuries um, to where we are today. And just Bitcoin is the next evolution. I see that. That's, uh, what do you got? Um, uh, what's his Two name? others I might recommend. Economics yep. in one lesson. I got that one. <laughs> yep. <that's laughs> and this is just, Pretty easy to read. You can also check him out on YouTube. It's kind of a compilation of his YouTube videos and stuff. But yeah, Andreas Antonopoulos. Yep, great book too. I have both of those books. So relatively short, easy to digest, informative. Yep, those are my go-to uh, books to pass on to people. The Bitcoin yeah, Standard, the Internet of Money. But those books too. Maybe we should include uh, links, kind of uh, where you might be able to get them if somebody's interested on. Uh, learning about that going right to the greed affiliate links all right we'll set them up We're not amazon affiliate I'm just busting your chops man <laughs> it's just it's just good for people to know they get the knowledge of these kind of things and you know it's <clears throat> it's it's good to dive down that rabbit hole yeah it and, is what it is you know and also like you were saying like using bitcoin for purchases and things at some point i feel like um what's going to happen is <clears throat> you're going to have maybe like you could put some of your bitcoin in a custodial account that you could kind of have like a debit card in there where, you know, you, you buy something and it goes to the bank and the bank says, okay, you have X amount of Bitcoin in there. It takes it out. Cause you know how sometimes we all know that Bitcoin sometimes can take a while to send if you're actually sending it to somebody, especially if um, the network is pretty busy. So a bank could see that you have a certain amount in there and then it goes, okay. And then it goes to the bank and it locks. As soon as that transaction happens, the, that amount is locked in your uh, bank account and then the, the bank can withdraw that. And then next thing you know, that transfer of money is still being made. So, cause sometimes people talk about Bitcoin where yes, it's a store of value and it shouldn't be used as everyday money, but I'm sure in the future there will be ways like that where you could actually use it on regular everyday purchases and stuff like that, you know? Um, so it's, and another thing too, going back where, People are concerned um, it's more in USD, right? They want to make money. They want to make dollars. You're not, you know, they, they want to make profits. And as we kind of said, like, I, I have conversations with my father all the time where he's a trader uh, and he, he always, you know, talks about taking profits and stuff like that. And I kind of say, well, like, you got to get away from that mindset in Bitcoin. I was like, you got to stop thinking of it that way. You got to think of it. Unless I was making profits of Bitcoin, then like, that's great. Yep. But I want, I want more Bitcoin. I don't want uh, more dollars. Like, yeah, unless I'm going to buy something or pay something off or whatever like that. But to me, I want, I want to, I'm looking at, you know, I want to stack sats. That's all I want. I don't want to sit there and stack dollars because to me, like, what am I going to do with it? It's just going to sit in the bank. Yeah. That, that's why as a trader, you should graduate from the U S dollar pair to the Bitcoin pair. You, right. You know, yeah. you know, I don't trade that much these days anymore, but if I do, I'm constantly just monitoring the pairs against Bitcoin and that's to collect more stats because that's what, that's the money denomination that I put my money in. I don't put my money into US dollars, so I don't really care what the price is. Yeah. And also the thing too is um, about dollars, you know, people say like, oh, well, you know, what is, what is Bitcoin? Like what backs it? Like why, why is it valuable? And then it's like, you know, it's like a trust in the system, right? Because people say like, oh, well, dollars, you know, I, I, I was like, well, you, you trust the dollars? So like, yeah, I trust dollars. I was like, but what backs the dollars? Well, the United States government. And I'm like, you back, do you trust the government? And then you, they, they, they pause for a second. They go, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I, I don't know. 
you it's know, true. I and mean, it's not even, it doesn't even have to be that you trust this Bitcoin, but do you distrust the financial systems we're dealing with now? And you yeah. can verify that. And they're raising our taxes while they just create money out of thin air to hand out. Like it, it doesn't make sense. And the, I think the hard answer to that question or the actual answer, I'm saying hard because I'm saying, trying to say the true answer is um, you just take Metcalf's law, the network effect, the, you could calculate the intrinsic value of a network. Uh, if someone asks me, you know, it's trust, it's tr what are you trusting in? I mean, what do you trust Amazon in? What does Amazon make? What does Am Amazon produce? What makes it so valuable? Amazon doesn't make or produce anything. Good TV shows now. It's, it's, it's just a network that connects right. millions of people and millions of merchants together. And that's what Bitcoin is. It's a network. It's a money right. network. So it makes its value based on Metcalf's law. And that's easily calculable. So you could produce um, value from it just using that right. math. It's, it's yeah, real. Yeah. So. And also, too, is like what we're going to see is um, going back to micro strategy uh, square where, um, you know, these companies are taking their cash reserves and uh, purchasing Bitcoin as a store of value to, you know, basically instead of holding cash and you go go back to Apple. And, uh, you know, we always talk about this, but, the, you know, the number, I think, is what, a quarter of a trillion dollars they have in actual cash, like, you know. At some point, if they do buy Bitcoin, it's going to be insane where they start, even if they put 10% or a quarter of that in there, you know, that's, that's when you're going to see these huge run-ups. And yeah. I mean, it may be happening right now. You're not even aware of it. Yep. Literally. So when you see that and, um, you know, and the thing is too, is when these companies purchase this stuff, because they're, they're, they're not going to look to make a quick buck. Right, they're, they're not looking to go. Oh, let's let's just dump it, you know, whatever. And then you might not see because, like, the biggest concern right now with the market, per se, is that four-year cycle thing where it runs up and then it dumps, and then it runs up and then it dumps. And um, you know, they're talking like trip, like huge corrections after a big run-up, mm -hmm. where we had twenty thousand went down to three thousand. You know, that's a really big uh, difference. But once these companies start doing that, you know, there may not be that big uh, bear market like we've always been used to because now all of a sudden you have these large corporations and hedge funds that are just holding this stuff and they're not going to touch it and they're kind of just putting it away. And at that point, it's, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, I, I feel like I, I believe that in the next year or two, we're going to see run-ups of well over six figures and that's going to be definitely an interesting thing um you know so i don't know where all this is going to go you know there's, there's no there's nothing's perfect nothing you know there's no um magic uh ball or something like that that's gonna give you you know tell the future or not but i think it's definitely going to go in that direction you know what i'm saying jeff i do i do i was thinking the same way i feel like uh i'm just greg's probably entering his third market cycle. I'm just starting to enter my second one. Right. Um, and just in that short amount of time, my about 10 days shy of, of exactly three years in, in a space. Um, but seeing these, these big names and big, large amounts of money, I mean, the hedge funds, uh, they're just starting to get into it. Yeah. They're not going to let it correct that, but it was all the retail game before and it's not the case anymore. So I feel like this cycle, you know, wrapping up towards the end of next year and then the next four year cycle is going to be uh, different. Yeah, different. It's, it's I agree. Good. And even even at this point over time, if you look at the logarithmic scale of Bitcoin with the price action, the volatility is going down over time. It doesn't right. seem like it because we're looking at big numbers and comparatively big fluctuations. But if you look from the beginning of you know Bitcoin's inception to now, volatility is already shrinking. You know? Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> too, I'm looking at right now, I'm looking at Google Trends, right? So right now, um, you know, and I'm not an expert on this stuff, but I'm looking as of right now, this week, Bitcoin is showing an 11. I, I don't know what that means, maybe 11%, I, I don't know. But uh, the last time, you know, before the big run up, it was at 11, was in September of 2017. Now, I don't know, maybe you can get a price real quick on 
at that time period just to see where Bitcoin was at. Um, in the, basically September 17th, 2017. But uh, if you look when Bitcoin hit its, you know, November, December of 2017, where um, I think the price was around 10,000 or maybe a little bit more than that, you know, that number was 65. So it was six times greater when it was half the price then. So I don't know where it's going to go once you see. I'm going uh, to screen share that, Matt, so people can see what you're talking about. Okay. As far as Google Analytics, this right. was the last uh, all-time high area when Bitcoin was tapping 20,000, which we're right there now. And you can see the FOMO hasn't even started yet. It's just starting to curl up, but it hasn't even peaked above some of these other areas. So really, we're just getting started in this cycle. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like I said, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, <clears throat> but again, it's hard to gauge from that. And the reason why I say that is um, when when Bitcoin uh, was out in 2017, it was getting like those searches, like maybe not as many people knew about it or maybe there wasn't as many people that were into it versus now maybe there's more people into it where everybody might know somebody that um, purchases it or, or has it and they can, you know, a friend, family member, where they can ask them versus going and searching for it. Yeah, exactly. I think that would be the counter argument to the trend argument, right? It's just that you're, I don't think the knee jerk reaction is to go Google Bitcoin. It's, you know, you're going to go look at Bitcoin somewhere else rather than Google it. Right. And so uh, the price <clears throat> around that time where it was at 11 was about 4,500. So let's just say hypothetically that, or, or whatever that, it, if it's, you know, you're comparing that to now, so you're talking about $80,000 maybe at a, at a run up, even if that's being conservative, you know, and I know Norm McGrath said something about, um, you know, a $65,000, $50,000 uh, price. And that's by next year. And he said that the last time, when uh, three or four years ago, when he said ten thousand dollars, and it ran up to twenty thousand, so you could definitely see some large run ups. And I think hey. we will. I'm confident we will. I think I we will. Financial advice. <laughs> I mean, one of my favorite charts to look at is again not against the U.S. dollar, but against other things, um, such as like against spot the spy exchange uh against spy s p 500 so if i go and screen share this real quick this is bitcoin against spy so how has spy been doing in against bitcoin over the last decade it's been getting freaking annihilated so that's my stock market stock market um uh analysis is like the CEO you know, of um, Morgan where, Creek was on CNBC today yesterday and he was talking about if you value the stock market in gold it looks much worse if you value it in gold miners it looks even worse than he's like Bitcoin forget about it exactly so it's embarrassing like, come on we were at an all-time low in December 2017 against it so it will be interested to see it break that low it's going mm, to zero. that's a good one to watch yeah yeah so anyone is interested in looking at that yeah and, and the, the thing is too is i mean isn't aren't stock markets right now kind of all-time highs are very close to it you know I mean, all-time highs it. as the baby boomers are retiring on mass and how do they survive in retirement they sell so, yeah <laughs> uh, that's gonna be interesting i know uh, our generation and below definitely don't have much in the stock market comparative to the older generations um so the value's got to go somewhere. All right. All right. Anybody well, got anything else on the FOMO topic? No, I think I think we uh, did pretty good, and I uh, think that we should probably wrap it up now. You know. So, anybody got anything else to add right now? Uh, no. Happy hunting. <laughs>